Hey YouTube, this has been Drin Berger at Utah State University and today I'm going to talk a little bit about radioactive dinosaur bones or radioactive fossils. Um, I recently read a wonderful blog um, called uh, Mary Anning's Revenge um, that's a, a great funny um, blog on paleontology and I have a link below if you want to read the article. Uh, talking a little bit about the hazards of paleontology uh, and one of the things they mentioned is radioactive uh, dinosaur bones and how bone, uh, dinosaur bones are radioactive. And so I want to do a quick video demonstrating that yes, many dinosaur bones are radioactive. Um, so I brought out my guider counter and today we're going to look at some bones. Um, the first bone I'm going to look at um, is a bone I just brought back from the field from the Eocene. So it's an Eocene mammal uh, bone. It's around 46 million years old. And so I'm going to do a measurement of um, counts uh, per uh, minute because um, some, some of these are not as radioactive as other things. Um, now this is coming from the, uh, the Eocene uh, Washakie Formation and um, we're at seven counts here, nine counts. You can hear the clicks as I do the counting. Now, let's see how... We're up to 10. Eleven. Thirteen. That's two little clicks. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, up to seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. 22, 23, all right, so 23, 23 per minute. Uh, so that's one minute. <clears throat> so um, now let's look at some dinosaur bone. This is from the Morrison Formation, and this stuff is a little bit more radioactive than uh, the Eocene stuff. Although I have encountered some Eocene fossils that are fairly radioactive. Um, so let's see what this dinosaur bone in this shelf uh, reads at. <laughs> All right, you can hear it clicking a lot. <laughs> Lots of beeps on this stuff. All right, so we're already at 35, 30, 42, 46. Yeah. Eighty, eighty-two. It's going crazy. One hundred, one hundred five, one hundred seven, one hundred ten. Making me a little nervous. We're up to one hundred fifty eight, one hundred fifty one clicks. One hundred sixty six, one hundred seventy three. Yeah, this thing is radioactive up here. Coming up by one minute. And we are going to have 203 counts on the guider counter. So what is this stuff that's up here that's radioactive? This is a, a dinosaur bone <coughs> from the Morrison Formation that's, uh, that's fairly radioactive. Um, this is just material that, was, um, that we had done some destructive analysis with. There's no ends to this. We did some thin sections uh, cutting through some of this bone. But this stuff is fairly radioactive. So what makes it radioactive? Why are dinosaur bones radioactive? And why are other bones not radioactive? It has to do with something, uh, a molecule called uranium oxide. Uh, uranium, of course, is a radioactive element. It's a very large element, so it breaks down into actually other radioactive uh, elements. Um, and that uranium oxide is interesting because it's very soluble in water, meaning it dissolves fairly readily in water. Um, uranium, of course, then is found in many igneous rocks, which don't contain dinosaur bones. But because it's water soluble, uh, when groundwater moves through ig igneous bodies of rock, that can be volcanic ashes, it can be uh, igneous uh, basement rock. If that water moves through there, you can get a fairly fair amount of uranium oxide dissolved in the water, in the groundwater. That groundwater then moves through uh, the ground and it percolates into areas where there's organic content or cavities or spaces in the, in the subsurface around things like dinosaur bones and fossil wood 
um, any sort of cavity and then it gets deposited there and accumulates in larger amounts than the background uh, rock. Um, one of the great stories I read during the uranium rush here in Utah uh, was by Richard Pearl and he basically talked about how a uranium miner found a fossil log that at the time in the 1950s was worth a hundred thousand dollars based on the uranium content of that fossil log. So many of the uranium uh, miners in Utah uh, went after the uh, radioactive material in bones, in dinosaur bones, but mostly in, in petrified wood, uh, which is much more readily available. Um, they'd also uh, find uranium ore in many of these cavities in the rocks too. Um, there are two formations that tend to have fairly high radioactive material. Uh, the first is actually the Karoon Basin um, rocks in South Africa. It has some of the most radioactive uh, bones. Um, and the Morrison Formation in the United States it has fairly radioactive materials. Now, you're probably wondering, is this a health hazard? I mean, that's, that's pretty hot stuff up there. So, um, there are a couple risks that you need to be aware of if you're working on material, especially Morrison material that's fairly radioactive or working in the Karoon Basin on some of that material. And even, I've actually measured some pretty hot Eocene uh, fossils as well. This stuff is a too, too hot. Um, but you want to be, be very careful of breathing in any radioactive dust. Um, so always, always wear a mask if you're doing any sort of production of dust. So cutting, um, doing a fossil prep, wear a mask in addition to ventilation. So have like a big vacuum pump. A lot of labs have special ventilation to help keep down the dust. What you want to do is keep down the dust to a minimum because the dust of course is radioactive and if you breathe that in it can get into your lungs and then it kind of stays there for a while until your body can hack it out or remove it sometimes for long periods of time. And that dust that accumulates in your lungs is radioactive and that can cause lung cancer. So you always want to be very careful of breathing in any of that dust. Um, so a lot of times I recommend, I love these masks, they're very comfortable for fossil prep, uh, much more comfortable than just a, a simple mask. Um, and these are great, um, 40 bucks and you're, you're set to always wear a mask when you do fossil prep. Um, the other risk that you might have too uh, when you're doing this is if you have jewelry that's made out of dinosaur bones, which actually the article time talked about that link below. Um, so one of the things you want to do if you have any jewelry made out of dinosaur bones, check and see if it's radioactive. If it is, you get a fair amount of counts on it. Um, you can wear it, but don't wear it all the time. So, you know, just wear it out um, on an evening or something like that. Don't get rings made out of dinosaur bone because you'll be uh, uh, exposed to that for a long period of time or a pendant that you're going to wear for a long period of time because the more contact you have to that radioactive material, the more likely it'll cause harm. Uh, so those are the two big health hazards. Uh, one of the interesting things, um, a little historical information, when I was working at the American Museum, uh, initially they had stored a lot of the um, Morrison material that was radioactive in sort of a bunker. They, they basically kept a lot of the field jackets together, they kind of put it down in a bunker, they kind of sealed the door, you had to get kind of very special permission to go in there, um, and they deemed it as kind of, you know, to coordinate it off. And this is basically done in the 1950s when a lot of people were very concerned about radioactive material. Um, they did some studies uh, seeing what sort of exposure, what are the real dangers uh, to some of these dinosaur bones to the workers in a museum or in a collection space. And what they actually found was that dust is the, the the primary uh, danger is breathing in that dust. And so um, they recommend not doing that. Actually, one of the things um, that's come about some of the ideas of curating some of this stuff is to bring it out into light, um, have it exposed either not in a cabinet where it might, well, in a cabinet that won't collect dust, so protect it from collecting dust, but also having it on open shelving but then mitigate the dust by regularly vacuuming the fossils and making sure that dust doesn't accumulate on them that becomes radioactive and then can be breathed in by workers. So keeping it kind of open, an open space. They found that the, the biggest risk really was when people have things stored in uh, tight configurations or um, old wooden shelves and things like that that might become sort of radioactive and produce a lot of dust and then that dust being breathed in when people open it up to look at the stuff. Um, so one of the things is minimizing dust in a collection is really, really important for anything that's radioactive because that can be breathed in. And so that's one of the biggest risks 
for this material. So you want to be very careful, especially when you're doing things like cutting the dinosaur bone into pieces, <laughs> then you're not going to be breathing in that stuff. So uh, hopefully this is informative. Um, oh, one last thing I'll mention. Can you use this to find fossils? A guide counter. Uh, sort of. In, in theory, you should be able to go around and find uh, dinosaur bones using a guide counter. Um, one thing, though, is you really have to be pretty much up next to the fossil. <laughs> so if you are sitting here, like, probing the ground um, and looking at your guider counter, it's going to be a very slow way. You, using your eyes is actually a much, much better way of finding dinosaur bones than a guider counter. Although, theoretically, if you were blind, you could use the frequency of the clicks, and even a blind person could find uh, dinosaur bones using a guider counter. So uh, hopefully this is informative, and thanks for watching. Take care.